This episode of the Pursuit Podcast is presented by Fisher Skis. We're recording. We're live. We're blinking. What's up, everybody? Mr. Adam X. You're listening to the Pursuit Podcast on the Out of Collective. I'm in studio today doing... I just had a fantastic episode, so I'm super pumped about it. I had Kate Zaliff on. I called her Katie right off the bat, and that's how you really take care of a guest. But before we get into our guests, I want to talk about my wonderful sponsors that make this whole thing happen. And my first sponsor is Deuter, Deuter Bags. Dude, it's pronounced Deuter. I didn't name them. They named them. It was a man's last name. That's how it's pronounced. No more Deuter. It is Deuter. They make hiking bags. They make everyday backpacks. They have a brand new Avi bag that I cannot wait to get my hands on. Fully electronic. You can fly with it. You can do all the rad things with it. You don't have to worry about refilling uh, those combustible chambers. Bunch of recycled materials. They make duffels. They literally make bags for everything. They are phenomenal. The helmet holders on the back. I'm telling you, check out Deuter. Go to Deuter.com. Get yourself a bag. My second sponsor this week, you guys know it. You see them in the studio, Gravity Grabber. It's really the easiest storage solution. If you have a condo, a chalet, your house, your mudroom, your garage, you can hang your shovel, literally hang anything off of them. All gravity fed. It holds at the contact point. It does not pinch the tips, which is very important for long-term storage. Self-resistant pad or self-sliding pads. Uh, slip resistant is the word I'm looking for. We got a code for you. I believe it is out of bounds. Save you a couple bucks. They are so simple. They're so easy to mount. Uh, they got these little corners on them. So you line up the one, you just line up the rest of them. Super easy, super clean. Done. Gravitygrabber.com. Use code out of bounds. My final sponsor this week before we get into the amazing episode, Rumple, the original puffer blanket made of all of those techie materials you're used to in your base layers, in your puffer. They make a nano puffer blanket, packed down super small. You can take it on a plane, keep it in your backpack. It has a clip so you can wear it like a cape. Beer blankets for your koozies, for your nice cold Sierra Nevada. And here's the thing, this month, I believe it starts 11.14 to 11.28, they're doing 25% off the entire site. No code needed. Check in the check in the in the info below. I might even have a special code for you that maybe gets you something free. Maybe they have towels, gears, amazing collabs, hats, anything you really want. They have it. It's the only blanket that you will ever need to buy again. Use it from the couch to I literally bring it on airplanes to sitting around a campfire. So go to Rumple.com. You can use our code out of bounds, save you a couple bucks. But if you want to wait. Major 25% off sale coming. And now to my guest, Kate Zeliff. Had a background in ski racing. We talk about how ski racing stupid. That's my opinion, not hers. And her switch to free ride. Uh, we talk about mental struggle, burnout. Um, she recently hurt her back. So we're talking about a little rehab. I ask her basically the same exact questions every podcast ever asked. Uh, ever asked. Uh, no, it's such a good episode. Kate is an absolute rock star. Again, we talk about imposter syndrome, uh, business over humans. She had some internet drama, we'll call it, with a certain company. We talk about that. We talk about highs in her careers, lows in her careers, favorite music. It's such a good episode, and I can't wait for you to listen. Enjoy. Katie, there's no fun way to do this, so I let you do it. Who is Katie Zaliff to Katie Zaliff? Oh, for, I'm Kate Zaliff. See, that's, that's perfect. Part. Uh, man, how deep do you want to go? Um, this is up to you. I'm a big mountain skier. I live in Jackson, Wyoming. I'm from a little town in New Hampshire. Started skiing when I was young and have been in love with it and kind of have fostered my entire world around it, so... I'm a skier at heart, and uh, yeah. You're in Jackson now, correct? But born and raised in New Hampshire. Born and raised in New Hampshire and moved to Jackson when I was 20, so almost nine years ago now. Almost nine. You are getting old. Um, getting old. <laughs> did you grow up, like, skiing tucks? 
were you one of those where like your family took you up to Tux and was like boot packing a horrible boot pack or what did it look like? No, my family, my dad was into skiing. My mom wasn't so much. Um, but the school that I went to on Mondays, the entire school got out early and went to the mountain and got to go skiing. So I was introduced to resort skiing and fell in love with that when I was quite young. And I did go up Tuckerman's, but it was more a here and there thing. I actually went to high school in Southern New Hampshire and I guess I just didn't appreciate Tuckerman's and all the outdoorsy things we had going on because I was so focused on ski racing, but yeah, I love going home and if I can fitting in a tux, it's been a while, but it's a special scene up there. Ski racing's in the blood. That was the push you raced and we'll, we're going to jump all over the place, but you raced division one. The goal was to make the ski at us ski team. What happened there? I think it was a bunch of things. I think ski racing is something that I had been trying at for a really long time. And the tryout camp was the top girls in the country and girls that were far better trained than I. And actually I was doing quite well in all the splits, like all the actual races, but in the gym, I was pretty untrained. And then like in some other like, mind gate like I just wasn't as well trained and as I was kind of like a bull in a china shop and they kind of were like I don't know if you're ready yet and when that happened I think I kind of changed focus but all I knew was skiing so I stayed with skiing decided to take a postgraduate year kind of get it one more chance but at the same time I was ready to be done I had been doing it since I was in fourth grade you know, the majority of the year, because in the summers you're going to Mount Hood or down to the Southern Hemisphere, there's never a break. And so I think part of me was really excited for something else. That being said, I did go to college and ski for the University of New Hampshire for a year. I felt like it was a good way to get a degree, but turns out I was right about being over it and burnt out. And I then blew my knee out in January and it kind of made the decision for me to retire is what they call it from ski racing at 19 and move to Jackson and learn to ski pow. There's so much there. And again, we're going to jump around when they told you, you weren't ready. Did you understand it? Were you like, did you go home and were like, you know, they knew better than me at the time. Does that question make sense? It does. Yeah. I think like I kind of joke that, but I'm pretty sure verbatim the coach said, you are not mature enough to be on the U S ski team. And I think I did know what that meant. And I think I was mature enough. I don't know if I was driven enough. And I think ski racing is one of those sports where like you almost have to be type A because there's so much training and it's so intense and it's so blah, blah, blah. And that just didn't jive with my personality super well. And so it's not that surprising that I found myself in big mountain skiing, which I can still train and be an athlete, but I don't have to like get my blood tested all the time. And like, keep, you know, it's like just a different vibe. And I think I didn't want to be mature enough if that was the case. Like I like to have a good time. And if that wasn't accepted, that wasn't accepted. So I went and skied D1 and we partied really hard. It was great. Yeah. I don't think we should be mature to be skiers. I think that's why we're all skiers. Yeah. Ski racers are a different breed though. They're pretty intense. It blows my mind that anyone wants to ski race. Like how you had talent at 19 and be like, I want to be a ski racer. We'll call it 18 because you were tired at 19. Like, how are you not like, I never want to ski that shit again. I just want to go ski powder. It's addicting. Like now that I've been removed from it, watching it, I am like, no, thank you. It's intense. You're wearing a skin tight suit with razor blades that are too intense. Like, it's just a ridiculous setup. But when I was in it, there was something so addicting about like one going really fast and two, the, this idea of being able, like, it's so simple to figure out who won because it's all timed. Like in big mountain, it's pretty subjective. It's like, Oh, that cliff, she hit it better than that girl who hit it. When in ski racing, it's like, if you're the fastest you win. And it was fun to have a clock to constantly be just instant feedback on you and what you're doing and I love athletics I love my like learning how my body works and to do the same course over and over again and have like a clock to test yourself against there's like a wicked rush you get from that I think 
we are clearly different people because I see racing and it just doesn't excite me like ever. I do one race a year and it's on a snowboard and it's the only time of year I ride the snowboard. <laughs> and my goal is just to like anyone who loses to me, you are shamed. This is like at our local resort. Like everyone knows like I'm a skier. I pull out the snowboard once a year and that's like last year I got like 12. It's not bad. I have a hundred. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. But like, I don't get it. I do not understand. There's so many cooler ways to go faster than <laughs> ski racing. It's got also a kind of a weird, if you're in it, you feel like you're really cool. It's like this, like, oh, now that I look back on it, it is kind of <laughs> culty and strange. But yeah, I digress. Oh, I see. I have so many things to say about ski racing because I think ski racers do think they're cool. But then mm -hmm. I think the other part of the ski industry is like, is that cool? Like, I can't do it. I'm not like shit talking ski racing and like that is a ton of talent and it is like super hard and I don't want to do it. But like that doesn't seem that cool. Like you guys stand up there in your spandex with like your trench coat on just waiting <laughs> while I'm just like ripping laps having a riot with my friends i'm like you guys get two runs today maybe four if you're lucky that part's definitely true it's ridiculous how little skiing you actually do i just don't yeah i guess winning is cool right like there's not a ton of money in it until you're like the best of the best at the world cup so that's also a tricky part is like before big mountain skiing, I had never made any money from skiing. I had only paid lots and lots of money for skiing. <laughs> what an insane thing. Okay. So you retire, you retire at 19 from racing. Mm -hmm. Do you know you're going free ride? You blow your ACL to pieces. Do you think ACL, right? That's correct. Yeah. Do you think you like, are you like, I'm going to be an accountant? No, God, no. Like, um, where's the thought process here? Because you're not just a pro free ride skier. Like it's you had to, you said it. You had to learn to ski powder, which seems insane. But it's an art. There's a reason people get paid. There's a reason people are pro skiers on arguably easier conditions. Like yeah. powder's easy. It, well, I think that I didn't ever really go. Like I didn't know what I wanted to be when I went to college, and I was going to college. So I felt like that's what I needed to do. And I just wasn't fulfilled at all. And yeah, I blew my knee out and kind of was like lost, I would say. And for some reason, I had always been drawn to the West. I think uh, when I was younger, we used to go out and ski race in Colorado or whatever in, in early season when the East Coast didn't have any snow. And I just liked it out there. I think it felt a bit more relaxed for some reason and again like as a child I was so I went to boarding school but I was like on full ride so I was like a kind of a poor kid at like this like super rich institution and it was all just so intense all the time and I think I would go out west go ski racing and be like oh everyone's so chill here like they're legalizing marijuana like whoa and <laughs> but I think I was always drawn to it and then I basically had a good buddy who was moving to Jackson and had a cousin that lived there. And one of the kids on the UNH ski team was also from Jackson. So I had like these faint ties to Jackson. I had never been there, but I just knew that's what I wanted to do. And I had no vision. Like there was absolutely no vision. It was like drive out there, see the sites and then see whatever odd job I could get and hopefully find housing. And I did. So that was kind of the baby step process to, I, I had no expect. I didn't, like I knew what big mountain skiing was. I knew who Lindsay Dyer was. I thought it was cool. I didn't know if that was going to be my life. <laughs> At what point did you realize it could be your life? Probably the first Corbett's comp in like 2018, I think. It was like. Yeah, that pretty... went well, huh? It did go well. <laughs> yeah, it went real well. <laughs> Twice. I had a great three years and I was like, you know what? this is silly. Once you jump in that thing six times, you're like, I feel like odds are starting to work against me. I stomped every one of them. I don't really want to keep pushing the envelope, but that 2018 one really opened the doors. I think like one, we had so many viewers because of Red Bull and the demographic they pull. So I got my name out there and I got a handful of Instagram followers, which tends to help your recognition. And then was in a couple of ski magazines and then was asked to be in Warren Miller. And it kind of just like, kept going from there. And 
I mean, for the first three years I was doing films, I still had other jobs and now I get to do it full time. So that's pretty exciting. Yeah. Pay skiers, so, pay athletes. Pay us. Going into King and Queens of Corbett's, you're just a local ripper, right? Yeah, totally. I'm working at the ski school and the Thai shop, like <laughs> a Thai restaurant. And then you win. Yeah. And you can, the cool thing about winning the first one is it's the first one. Like it's the inaugural. It's that one's always like, that's the staple. Hopefully in 20 years, they like show like clips from the first, they don't show clips from like the seventh. Yeah. <laughs> Who cares about the seventh one? Like it's crazy. It's still going so hard. I think it's such a relatable spectacle. Like it's Corbett's anyone who's been to Jackson, like you can, it's right off the tram. It's right there. It's not this cliff that you have to like hike to, or like there are rad dads who can watch it and be like, I've skied off that like real half assed. I made that like shitty turn that you have to do in because they didn't drop it. That's very true. Yeah. That's a good point. I think that's the appeal. And I think it's so, I think that's why it does so well. Cause it's like the one thing, even I'm myself, I'm nowhere near pro skier, but I'm definitely not a rad dad, but like I can watch that and be like, Oh, they're making that look really, really easy. And like, it's scary. I remember the first time I was there, it's like, I have to drop it. And I, like some kid, I was like looking at it and some kid just like gone. Oh, it's yeah. like, Oh, I have to do this. <laughs> and then I was like, okay, I can do like the, like crappy, like, it's always like that left-hander and then that quick right, right? Because there's that left wall that just like wants to murder you. Yeah. But it's easier to drop, I think. This is my hot take. I think Corbett's is easier to drop than it is to s slowly ski into. Probably. I feel like it's if you get the rhythm of that goat path turn, it's not terrible. And the crazy thing about hitting Corbett's is how blind it is. So when you like step away from the lip, you can't see it's anything. Gone. And so that part I feel like is the part that would be harder for people is to like take that leap of faith. And then it's all like brute strength after that. Like you just have to muscle yourself, but that goat path just eats people up if they're not ready for it. I think it's worse. I really do. And like, I'm not good by any means, but like I would rather drop it. And I'm not like, I'm like backing up a thousand feet and sending it, but I'd rather drop it land way forward and tomahawk out than like attempt to hit that goat path. Yeah. Well, that's commitment. I'm, so I'm going to be there like this year and someone's going to call me out on this. And I'm going to like hit the goat path and skirt out. <laughs> Does it change overnight? You win Corbett's. Is it like instantly, like how long do you continue to have to have a quote unquote real job? And I'm putting real job in quotes because what you do is a job. Yeah, for sure. I would say, honestly, like, to, it didn't happen overnight. I would say, like, things changed overnight in the sense that I was, like, I got on the North Face, and I did a Warren Miller premiere, and I was in Powder Magazines, but I was still low on the totem pole at the North Face and Blizzard and, like, definitely wasn't making enough money to survive off of. And so two years ago is the first time I stopped gardening in the summer, and that was really cool. And I have been able to pick up other things and train harder and better. And I think, like you said, it, some people, I feel like don't understand the amount of work that goes into creating a career that actually allows you to live off of. Cause it is, it's like a bunch of like computer time and meetings. And like, if you watch like Michelle Parker is a perfect example, she's crushing and she's like on a plane going to like MC rampage and then like come back to like do a movie premiere. Like it's impressive what people are able to do with their time. And if I can allot any extra time I have to training, that just makes me a better athlete. And so I always felt like I was struggling because I'd have to go to work to make money. So I couldn't train to do the job that I'm trying to do really well, you know? So it's really nice to have the focused time to be an athlete and to do all the things that come along with being an athlete. Like, Sometimes I have to go to PT three times a week because I work myself, you know? <laughs> yeah. Sometimes you have to sit and talk to a stranger in a library for an hour. 
Like this is all, how much time would you say you spend, let's say winter, like, do you get to actually take the winters off and go skiing or is it like I'm spending 60% of my time on a computer and then I actually get to like the only blip that we see is that three minute edit at the end of the year. We ski a lot, but we just do computer work at night. Like, <laughs> I feel like summer is definitely more like planning, kind of like, you know, check-ins, contracts, have conversations about gear, upcoming gear, because everyone has a bit more time. And I do feel like winter is more focused on skiing. However, if you're like me and you're like a workaholic because you like it so much, you're also on like five different projects. And then like, so therefore you've got like a couple different teams that you're communicating with on how weather's looking. Like you could be on one trip looking at weather on another trip. And that's like something I try to be as in the moment as possible on those trips. But like, there are always things that pop up that you need to attend to. So it's just finding more of a balance with it, I guess, or trying to. How do you, and I'm sure this answer is different for everyone. How do you help control burnout? Uh, I'm not the best at it. I'm currently incredibly burnt out, uh, <laughs> but I think my, I'm very lucky because I love skiing so much that I can feel incredibly burnt out and then take some time to do other things. And I don't need that much time to recuperate because I enjoy what I do so much. But I think as I've gotten older, I've been better at like noticing the signs of burnout and trying to get on it sooner than later, like try not to get too deep into the burnout. But I think like, to the listeners, I, I threw out my back on Thursday and it was because I like for the last three months, I went to Bali and went paragliding for two weeks. And I went to New Zealand and learned how to speed ride. Then I flew back to Boston and took a wilderness EMT course. That was a month long. That was like eight hours a day and then would have to study at night. And then I'd be lifting at the gym after I was in my chair all day and then yeah, do that on repeat. And then I was on the tour for MSP. So I was driving around in my truck, sleeping in my truck, you know, like then I get home and I hit the gym hard and it's like, my body was just like, Hey, we've been screaming at you to stop. We're going to hurt you. <laughs> now you're going to like be forced to stop. And so sometimes I get to this stage of burnout where I'm like, God, I just was muscling it for too long, but I tend to be able to bounce back quickly. So I'm just going to keep riding that wave and hope that continues throughout my career. <laughs> I like that you just did completely admitted that you're bad at handling it. You keep your foot on the gas and then you're not going to do anything to adjust that other than just like, I think I got this. Oh man. I mean, I keep, I keep like, that's the thing, right? Is like the, the better you get at something, the more opportunities you get and you love it. So you keep saying yes, because you love it. But then all of a sudden you forget that you're just a human and like you need a day off from time to time. Like a lot of my filming seasons to date, I've only had like a couple of days off where I've gone and free skied. Like I will take mandatory days off if I've slammed or like need a break. But I think I would like to prioritize giving myself more free ski time. Just like, I don't know. I think there are ways that I can find a more sustainable way to go about this. It's just, I've been really like, I don't want to say I felt like I'm on the chopping block, but this industry is really tough. And it feels like you have to keep proving yourself to this industry and keep proving yourself to sponsors to make a living wage. And that's like kind of stressful, especially when your body is tired, you know, you don't want to like miss out on the day of shooting that could like make your season because you're tired. So there's a lot of pressures that kind of come along with it. And I think as I settle into the industry and feel as if I belong and know that I'm deserving of my spot, then I won't have that desire to like, like this year, for example, my plan is to work on one big project and I'm really excited about it, but I'm trying not to take on too many other things because it leads to burnout. So this year I'm trying to be better. So there is hope for you. There is some change involved oh. <laughs> a oh. little, I, I mean, I can't imagine. And I, I just think people listening and I'm poking this bear a little bit because I think people listening think it's like 
the greatest thing in the world all the time, which like it is, you get to ski, but like there's a ton of pressure and like you never get to leave it. Like an engineer, we'll just say an engineer can clock in at nine o'clock and can clock out at five o'clock. You don't get to do that. Whether it's PT, skiing, answering emails, answering DMs, like it's, Sleep. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't end. I'm also like, like I said, I can say I'm, I'm obsessed. Like I'm genuinely obsessed. And so I will also, especially in the winter, be thinking about before bed terrain or a line that I skied that day or a line that I saw or something I saw in the movie. Like those are the things like I need to definitely get better at the mindful piece, but like, I like it so I can think about it all day long which is like a blessing and a curse. Cause it, like you said, I can never clock out. I think I could teach myself to be maybe more aware of it and present, but it's like, I, I love it. Like I'm thinking about it. I'm like, yeah, yeah. Like I'm all fired up. And so it's like, I don't know. If you, Sometimes, weren't, if you weren't skiing, what would you be thinking about? I don't know. I get all worked up about climate change and like the political state. So I guess it's better to think about skiing than like stressful topics. Yeah. You can't, we're not going to talk politics on this show ever, but it, I mean, I think that's one we can all agree on, but like, it is crazy, especially in the last couple of years, you can't even like have conversation. I can't because I want to have conversations, but I get so boiled over that. I'm like, this should matter. This should matter. <laughs> so then you're like, I can't focus on that. Yeah, it's tough. I think it's nice to have something like, I'm so grateful that I have something that I'm so fired up on and like keeps me excited. And I think without that life would be a very different experience. So yeah. Thank God for skiing. Yeah. Right. Sometimes I'm always scared that I'm going to hate it. Like that's my fear. That's like what I like. Like what if I put these, I spent all summer thinking about it and like lining things up and then I go skiing and I'm like, I don't like it as much as I thought I did anymore. Never happens though. No, it doesn't. I don't know. Skiing's weird. Like what? A, like I just talked about this with somebody. the The prep and the preseason is almost longer than the actual ski season. Oh, for sure. Like the hype and stuff. It's insane. And people get so fired up, like the first snowfall, and I get it, but it's just kind of funny. It's so crazy, like how we literally obsess over it. And I think it's a good thing to be, for lack of a better term, addicted to. But it's like, what? Like, I, I don't know. I feel like you're like going back to you getting like cut from the U S ski team. Like your coaches knew better than you. Then they were like, this isn't where you belong and you'll find it. Yeah. And like, it's weird when someone looking in knows that better than you do from yourself, from your own point of view. Yeah. When you're young though, you like, I feel like it's, you just don't know the other options. And so that's why I'm like very grateful that you know, it's like as cheesy as it is, I think I like to think that everything works out just the way it should. And that helps me get through like the kind of crappy situations. But I would also say that like, yeah, I blew up my knee and that sucked, but it led me to Jackson, which led me to this life I've pulled out of my ass to be quite frankly, <laughs> like I can't like, like it just happened. Like I didn't even know I wanted it. And then it happened and here we are. And so I like to think that that's the case and then it always will because it's stressful that way. Yeah, I have two sides to that coin, I think. Because it's like, yeah, you can say it just, like, happened. But, like, you took the risks. Like, you drove right. your car across the country and you moved to a place you didn't know. And you took arguably a shitty job. And, like, when you could have just been like, okay, not saying that this is giving up. And that's just what some people are made to do. But, like, you could have just went to school and, like, been an accountant. Like, that's, like, my friend's an accountant. He was born to be an accountant. Like, it makes sense that he's an accountant. So I think, I don't know. I think we don't, as ski bums, as skiers, because you would have taken that same risk even if you didn't end up a pro skier. Like, you would have done that. You would have just, that's who you are. That's like what, I don't know, what drove you to do that no matter what. And then the success came through because you just happened to be really freaking good at it. Yeah. And I think I like, wasn't afraid to take the chance, you know, like I feel like while we're talking about the universal, you know, hippy dippy, uh, like if you make, which I did complete space for something to come true, 
it will, like where there was a lot of kids that did have a college degree that moved to Jackson and felt the pressure of their parents to get those like big girl, big, big boy jobs. And so they like, I think in their head, never let themselves believe that they were going to be a pro skier because there's all this like pressure to use the thing that they, and I never had any pressure. I never had got a college degree. And when I started doing well in skiing, I was like, well, I'll chase this. This is the best thing I got going. And that worked out. Did you feel, or do you feel you have something to prove? Fuck yeah. Big time. Hell yeah. I'd be better about it, honestly, because I think, I think that there's like ways to be inspired that are healthier, but I would say like, there's definitely been like last year was a big year about like, I got dropped from TGR and I just wanted to show people that I deserved a spot in the industry somewhere. And I was lucky enough to get a call from MSP and I went on three trips and I like had this like one trip in the middle that was just like, I was just confident and feeling good and everything was working. And there was like this, like, I, I feel like it came from that, like something to prove. Like I had like this, like something going on that made me stomp some things and I'm super proud of and like ski things in a certain way. And there's like always work to be done. And like, I have so many things I want to get better at, but I think it served me really well last winter and it gave me the weird extra energy to make a bunch of different projects happen and put the best skiing that I can out. And so yeah, I definitely have something to prove, I think, but also try and understand that I belong in the industry and like not have it be too much of a like driver, you know, it's kind of a negative thing. Yeah, I think it's good and bad, right? Like we all have imposter syndrome. Are we supposed to be here? Should we be here? And then let's talk about the TGR thing, because I think people listening want to talk about the TGR thing. Uh, you po- For anyone who doesn't know, you got dropped from TGR after, like, that was one of your main goals, was to get it with TGR and film with TGR, and you did that. And then you got dropped, and you, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, and I'll give you the floor, but you felt like they dropped you for, I don't know what reasons, or because you stayed loyal with your ski sponsors. Uh, and the comments lit up, and it was a whole bunch the internet was the internet and we'll say that and like good, bad, ugly, great. But like the reality is it's your personal, or at least how I saw it, it's your personal page. It's your internet. It's your social experience. And you said what you felt like you needed to say. Yeah, I think so. I'm going to turn off my phone so it doesn't keep doing that. That's fine. It was like the loudest bing in my ear I've ever heard in my life. Um, yeah, so I definitely, maybe I was naive and I want to honor the fact that maybe my timing wasn't the best, but my thought process, I was at home in New Hampshire, I was taking a wilderness EMT course and yeah, it was the, the day of the TGR premiere and I had some people like slide into my DMs and ask if I was going to be at uh, the Jackson premiere and I was saying I wasn't and then I realized I like, no, I never told anyone or like said anything about moving from TGR to MSP. And I didn't actually think there was a reason to, but then I like went back and watched some old segments and I was like, damn, like super proud of these and like that work I did. And so I put up my first segment with TGR and just explained that I won't be at the TGR film. And <clears throat> that unfortunately something went down that made it so that I couldn't film with them. And that <clears throat> I missed, like, I loved my chance to work with the the editors and the creatives and the cinematographers because they're all fantastic and basically just like thanks for my time and then grateful that I was picked up by MSP and excited to share and that's where I'll be this year like that type of thing and in my head I did it as respectfully as possible I wasn't trying to poke the bear I just felt like I had never said why I'd switched and so I just like maybe I'm naive I guess I definitely poked a bear and yeah there's a lot of people that showed a lot of support for that post. And I try to be as raw and honest on my social media as possible. I try to like not just show the highlight reel because I think that's unfair. And I like to, I share things about my mental health. I share things about different stages of my life. And I obviously keep some things close to my heart and like need some privacy, but I also feel like my little sister's six, well, 17 now, 16, 17. And she, 
I just worry about this younger generation only seeing me putting up me in a helicopter, high five in the boys and stomping lines. Like the project that I'm working on this year, I'm excited because we're going to do this whole se- like whole film and it's going to be based on a trip to Alaska, but we're also going to film all of the leading up preparation because so much goes into what we do as athletes and all that we share is the best of the best. And I think that's doing everyone a disservice because it's just not true. And so I put up the truth and there was definitely some people that felt like my timing was inappropriate and that I was, um, I forget, slandering, I think was a term used. And that was not my intention at all, but I understand how I ruffled some feathers and I don't think it was worth the reaction, but I also am trying to understand how it could be triggering and someone could take it personally, but it's important for me to tell the truth. And I don't think I really out, outstepped my boundaries and I had no intention of slandering. I just was telling what happened and yeah, it's a longer story than that, but I'll leave it at that. We forget that we're dealing with humans and everyone just thinks of them as brands and numbers. That's what I struggle with the most, to be honest with you, because we're brands and numbers that are out there risking our lives. And I think that's being so disposable for a company that I literally blood, sweat, tears, baby, every year into those films, like broken bones and giving it my all. And again, that's not their fault. That was my desire, but we were making films together and they, and, and like, yeah, it's just like, it's so fascinating how you can go from being like what you're told as a family to then just like being dropped so quickly. And like, I want to say that Hillary Nelson's death was incredibly sobering in that regard to she is the best in the world. And she died doing the thing she loves the most, the thing that her is her career. And I think obviously my heart goes out to everyone who is missing her and has a hole in their heart because of that loss. And I would also say as like a young professional skier, it was just like really sobering because you think that the best in the world don't make mistakes. And I think you're flirting with danger a lot in this career. And that's something that we're all aware of, but then for you, to get totally hooked, like, got to be careful with my wording, but then just like feel like you are just like a puppet and you are so disposable. It's like, it's a really yucky feeling because you're taking such risks and you're surrounded by people that you trust in the mountains with your lives. And that's like the level of respect I give to people when I'm operating in those ways. And yeah. I guess some people just see it differently than I do. And and that's okay. No, I think you said it properly. I don't think you, I think anyone who disagrees with you, who is listening will obviously always have something to say, but I think it's, there is the business side of it. And it's, you know, it's the whole, like that's business. Like it is. And that sucks. And it sucks when we think it's more than that. And I do believe, I truly believe this, that the industry is changing a little bit with that. And I I had a conversation with Conrad about Hillary and, you know, because she was a female and she's a mother, it's like, she's held on this higher pedestal and like, no one would be like, as in like, she shouldn't have been taking those risks because she's a mother. For real. Yeah. And it's like, well, how come no one's mad at the dad for taking those risks or like, that's just, That's what you guys do. You're professionals. You're athletes. You are paid to perform at the highest level. And we hope that brands understand that and take care of you long-term through everything. If you get married and have children, I mean, Emily Harrington, like that's, you know, she, I like to think that Hillary, and again, I have no idea, but like Emily looks at Hillary and is like, holy shit, I can have a career and be a mother and do these things. And it's, I do. And there's think- a few of those, you know, like it's crazy when you notice one and then you notice, you know, others, but there's so few. So for Emily to even have one person and then for hopefully me to have four people, you know, just like, and I think that's a systemic piece. That's really interesting about the women conversation, because like when you ask that question about like, or you, you stated that like, yeah, why aren't we asking 
the dads, why they were taking that much risk. And it's like, that's the piece that's still so alive and well that we're trying to fix, but it happens like way low down on the totem pole. We're talking like (laughs) even the way we talk to little girls or the way that we like put little girls in this category, like they don't get dirty. They don't, you know, like that's a, that's a deep rooted one that I agree with you. The industry is certainly changing. I just hope that it continues to change in like, you know, if we have more women in films, that's awesome because of course it has a trickle down effect. There's just like a lot of work that I feel like needs to be done. And that's on the backs of the people like in every, like in, in your studio to like treat everyone fairly and with kindness. Like, like, I think that just like, we all should do that in general and treat everyone as equals because we are like, I'm the first to tell you that like, I understand that men are like stronger and like built to be hunter. Like I'm down with that. I understand that. But like my brain isn't like a little girl, little, little brain. It's like, we are equals, you know, like we can do this together. And I think we're getting there and it's really cool to see. And I hope that just keeps. Yeah. But I think that's all evolving too. Like I could arguably beat you in a, in like a UFC match. Like I've probably got you by a, a hundred pounds and like, great. But like, if you drop both of us off at the top of a mountain, I might be able to like trickle my way down it, but like (laughs) you are going to destroy it. Like you are so much stronger in every sense at the top of the mountain than I am. Right. So like strong is like a loose term. Like, I don't know. My girlfriend hunts, my girlfriend like, like shoots deer and like I eat it and cook it. Like, like it's just how, you know, she races motocross. She's raced motocross her whole life. Like got me back on a dirt bike. Like it's just, which is cool. Oh, yeah. Like it's all just like that's, it shouldn't matter. Do what you're good at. I don't care if you're male or female, but like Jess specific case, my girlfriend, her dad had four daughters and he raced motocross his whole life. So like you bet your ass, those girls are going to race motocross and yes. it just set a new norm, right? Like, And I think that's like what is happening, which is so cool. And it is just like the boxes are being stretched right now. And that's like super exciting to see. And I know it freaks some people out, but yeah, man, more of that. I'm all about it. Anyone who's freaked out sucks ass like that. Like get over it. (laughs) I just, and like what I really want to see, like I love like Nexus. We have this all female ski film. So rad but I don't even want to see that. Like, and that sounds shitty if someone just clipped that and put that in, but like, I just want to see where like males, females, everyone can just go skiing and have fun. Why does it have? And I get why it has to be right now. And that's like also the thing that I struggle with in the industry because I have had so many supportive male counterparts and athletes on trips who like, I love and are fucking awesome. And like, this isn't like a guy versus girl thing. And like, I feel as a woman, I keep getting these opportunities to be in all women's films, which of course, like Nexus was an absolute riot. Like, I'm so glad I did that. And of course I want to continue to work with more creatives that are women because I've had very, like it's, I'm one of few on trips still. And that is what it is. But I guess I'm bringing all this up because like, I love skiing with dudes and I love shooting with dudes. I love skiing with chicks and you know, like you need the balance. And like, I hope we get to a place where it's just all even cause that's where some really cool stuff is going to come together because I do, I see the different sides of the table and what men can bring and what women can bring. And obviously it's not that set in stone, but you just see like these different nuances and that's what creates like a really good, well-rounded team. So yeah, I like the direction, but it doesn't need to be like, girls versus boys yeah and like what's the nexus the slogan is like there can only be one or there's only one or how to i can't remember i never one is enough or something yeah, well that's what is, michelle parker got told that her whole career right michelle's mm-hmm. like we could just do podcasts about michelle that's like our new that's gonna be our new platform we just talk about michelle parker because but she's 35 fucking rips and like i don't know there was some shady shit when she was like 18 on k2 like there was like bikini ad like that's all shit that like she had to go through Mm -hmm. unfortunately and like she's 
pay at 35 she's already like legend status and paving the way for everyone below her yeah she's a boss and i think she is doing things so beautifully and yeah i've got nothing but respect for that woman yeah she i mean hopefully like we said that she was one and maybe she had one to look up to two to look up to but now maybe there's five to look up to and then hopefully the younger generation has 20 to look up to and it just keeps 20 seems like such a small number but like hopefully it just grows and evolves and it doesn't seem that difficult but it is it is unfortunately like if you look at the free ride world tour and the free ride world qualifying circuit this may have changed, but when I was competing, they only allowed one female and they allowed three men. And the argument at one point, and I'm probably going to misstate something, but my understanding was that like the amount of prize money came from the amount of athletes of each gender in the comp. And so there's less women, so therefore less money, but then you trace it back and you're like, but you are the one that said only one woman could make it out of the free ride world qualifying series to go to the free ride world tour, but three men don't. So like, this is a chicken or the egg conversation. If you want to have equal pay, like I just worry that sometimes like we're making a lot of progress in some ways, but we're still like, like women snowboarding just gets like pretty tough end of the stick in the free ride world tour. And like, that's not helping grow the sport, you know? So you're like these, like, I don't know. It's just like, you gotta evolve in other ways to make sure that systemic piece starts to hopefully go away. How do you think we change it? Well, I think that's like a bigger conversation for society. Like, I feel like we are still struggling with things as a society that are, in my opinion, ridiculous, like taking women's reproductive rights away and things of that nature. And I think that's not helping our cause because on a bigger level, women are learning that they don't even have control over their own bodies. And that's not really inspiring. Um, And so I feel like it's more about, like you said, with your girlfriend's dad, like, regardless of if you have a boy or a girl, like teach them skills, (laughs) like, like how to change the oil, even if it's a girl or like, I don't know. My stepmom painted my room pink and I like, didn't like pink. And like, I liked other colors and that was okay. And like, I don't know. I just feel like little girls can be put in this box of like, sit down, be good. Don't speak up. And I think as a society, we kind of like, unfortunately, accidentally, create really insecure women that aren't willing to put themselves out there. And I'm speaking from experience. Like I've been really insecure a lot of my life, whether well, like I've dealt with it, but like in, in high school, for example, like I was super conscientious of my weight because I could back squat like 360, you know, like I was like trying to be as strong as possible, but I also was told by, I felt big and like strong. What didn't matter, you know, like even, I guess I was in high school a long time ago. That was 2012, but like body image, I think we've gotten better at as a society of understanding that strong is beautiful. And so if we can like understand how much advertisement and the way we speak to the like children, like that stuff goes a long way just in allowing them to have the confidence to try skiing, let alone taking it to the next level. Yeah. It's so, I think that's the good and bad of the internet, right? Let's just say social media is like, we have people like you who are sharing their stories and just being open and transparent. But then there's other people who are just like, it's all fucking butterflies and rainbows. And you're like, no, no, no. Tell some truth. So people who are struggling can relate. Yeah. Cause we're all human, you know, like it's a stressful time to be alive and I think sometimes we do ourselves a disservice by pretending we're all good because you ultimately just mask things and inevitably have a like mental breakdown or something, you know? So I feel like, like we're all in it together. We don't need to like misery doesn't need company in the sense that we need to be like boo hoo all the time. Like I think it's important to spread light too. And that's honestly like why I love to create and make ski movies is I see how much stoke people can just get from watching a ski movie. And that's like something I can bring to the world, even though right now that feels rather petty. It's like, I can bring Stoke or help bring Stoke to a room full of people. Fantastic. But yeah, man, like I'm not going to pretend that like everything's perfect. Cause that's not true. Life isn't perfect. It's messy. It's complicated. It's like a constant roller coaster. And 
I'm doing my best to hang on. I think we all are. And I think, yeah, be honest about it. We're fine. We're hanging in tight. It's kind of fun. A little yeehaw. Yeah. I don't think it's petty. I think it's like, I know I'm, I'm engulfed by the ski industry now. So like, I, it's like, it's what I do for a, a job. I don't, I'm not good at it, but I can fucking talk for some reason. But like that room full of people, that's cool. That is like, it's neat to see people put their phones down for 27 minutes mm -hmm. and watch something and clap at the end of it. And like, that is neat. That is powerful. Like, so I don't think it's petty. I think it's, I don't know. I think it's like, it's, it's not even what you guys deserve for how much blood, sweat and tears went into all of that. Like you deserve more than that. And I don't know. I don't think it's petty. I get, I get DMS that people are like, I love your show. And I'm like, I am an idiot who like <laughs> someone gave a platform to and I just slide into pro like actual athletes DMS. And I'm like, Hey, please come on and give me clout. Thank you. Like that is what I do. Like it's, but in some way, shape or form, I'm providing a service and people are just like amped. Like people are like, dude, you got me from Western New York to Colorado. Like I like binge listened to your episodes. And like, that's insane. Like that is crazy. That's cool. Congrats. That's impressive. I, this is all about me now. No, but it's, <laughs> I just think like, I do think I will use we as like, we discredit ourselves. But like, when you think about how much time and effort goes into that four minute part, like it, it is a service. So like, you should be proud of it and you should pat yourself on the back. Obviously you don't need like this big inflated ego, but like it's a job. You've sacrificed your entire life to do that. Yeah. And I think it also is super fulfilling to me. And that feels like such a gift because then I like, I don't know. I have a lot of friends that love skiing and like maybe aren't as fulfilled by their job. And like, there's always that kind of questioning of like, should I just get like a normal job and like ski for fun? But the reality is like this job and the creation of these movies and like putting together sport and art is like, I just love it. And it's like also a great way for me to test myself and to keep myself in shape and focus. Like without a focus, I'm like off to out to lunch. So it's like nice for me to have something to focus on. And I feel like it's just, it fulfills me in a lot of ways. And it's also like, everyone thinks it's very cool, which is great. And like, hopefully I can inspire people and I have a platform that I would never have otherwise. And I get to travel the world and do things that I would never have had the opportunity to. I like the whole joke of like rooms that I'm in with people who I shouldn't be in simply because of skiing. You like find yourself in these like, Oh yeah. Really funny spots. And you're like, Oh, well I'll just try to fit in. Oh, it's imposter syndrome. Like I don't think it ever ends. Yeah, I know that part's hard. Cause like, I want to be comfortable in my space and I want to know I belong, but it's hard. Yeah. You're like, yeah, like kind of like you said at the beginning, like every year I like, I'm like, am I, do I remember how to do this? Like, oh my God, my whole livelihood depends on it, but it comes back. Yeah, I don't know how people, I listened to a podcast with Will Ferrell a long time ago and he talked about, he was talking about interactions and people were like, holy shit, you're Will Ferrell. And he's like, yep, I'm Will Ferrell. And like, it was like the <laughs> simplest statement, but that's how I think about it. And like, I am not Will Ferrell. I am not you, but like people are starting to like recognize my stupid haircut and they're like, you're Adam. And I'm like, yep. Like drove my, my rusted out sprinter van here. Like I am Adam. <laughs> like, I'm Adam. Yeah. Like it's a really bizarre thing, but you forget that people listen to you. They engage with you. They see you on the screen and you're just like, you hope you have a great experience with all of them. And like, you almost put on like your, I call it like my costume. Like my hair is my costume. It's always on, but like, yeah, I'm Adam X. Great to meet you. What's up? How do you know? Like, and you have that. How do you do in social situations? That's like the craziest part I think is how I'm sorry. I don't know how to turn off my you're fine. phone. You're fine. Um, but I'll say that, <laughs> 
I have the same thing. Like I can be like zoned out, tired, driving to an event, get out of my truck, see someone perk right up, like ready to go. And it's like this, like, like you said, like a, uh, like a facade or like this, I don't want to say it's a facade because I'm not like making up who I am, but it's like an elevated version of myself. And I find that to be so fascinating. And I also have kind of learned that I am an introvert in my practice of like needing to be alone to recharge. And so I've noticed as I've become, you know, like use the tour, for example, I go on tour for a week and a half, pretty much back to back shows with, you know, a I don't know what a full house is like 500 people or so like talking at you and wanting to chat. And I leave that tour so depleted. And it's because I come up every time I enter a room and I, I guess it comes back to balance and like our other conversation we had, but I, I tend to like, you know, run out of gas. Cause it, you, you can only dig so deep and then I have to go recharge. But I would say that I actually enjoy kind of that part of the industry and enjoy like rubbing elbows with people that do different things. Like I was down in Denver for an MSP premiere and I got to go to the North face lab and like talk to the designers and see what they're doing. And like, that's so cool to me. So I enjoy that part, but it's also, yeah, I find it pretty draining. And I found myself like when I come home, I kind of hibernate a little bit more than I would like to admit just cause I, just have a lot going on all the time. So when I'm home, it's like sanctuary time to like sleep. <laughs> sleep. Are you a reader, podcaster? What's like your, or is it like dead silence? No, I read. When I'm on the road, I like audiobooks, podcasts, music. I'm honestly like really, I like when I come home to like watch sometimes, sometimes like really mindless television or a movie, like something silly. Like give me um, just give cause me like my head, um, like bad mom's Christmas or something oh, stupid. Awful. Awful, but funny. And like, I'm exhausted. So it kind of like makes me laugh like laugh. And then if I fall asleep, it's not the end of the world because I'm my brain just needs to just like, be smush for a second and it can be mush when I'm watching bad mom's Christmas. So I want to say I'm not judging, but I am judging you. <laughs> you can judge. just know that I'm basically make it through 15 minutes of the intro and then I'm out like a light. Anyway, I sleep a lot when I'm at home. I just like catch up on all the lost hours. Yeah. I, I get it. It's weird. And it's also, I think it's part of like the mental cycle of like you go out on all these highs yeah. Oh yeah. And then you are alone and you're like, this is amazing. But also like, this is amazing. <laughs> and you're like you can just shut down. Yeah. It's amazing. But sometimes it's also like super hard. Like, especially if like the snow is good or if there's like something fun going on, but prioritizing the sleep ins and stuff like that. So yeah. Mental health is important. I don't think anyone is here to argue that. No, super important. And it's like easy to let that slip if you're not getting enough sleep and drinking too many drinks. Drinking too many drinks. Sierra Nevada's. <laughs> Thanks. Official beer of the podcast. We just got to throw sponsors in every once in a while. <laughs> got to throw sponsors in every <laughs> once in a while. Uh, what would you say the highlight of your career to this point is? Hmm. That's a good question. My gut wants me to say King and Queens because that was such a good pinnacle place. Another part of me wants to say my first TGR segment because my first TGR segment was like a pretty full personal segment of the skiing that I'm most proud of being in my backyard. Um, I guess, yeah, one of those, like the rest is our little, little moments, but those are like pretty as far as career go goals go, those are pretty substantial in my head. Can I ask what the lowest part of your career is? Hmm. And you can say no to this. Yeah, no, I think the lowest, part, like the kind of the part that I maybe struggle with the most is, yeah, just like making time for everything. Like I feel like we talked about it, but I do overwork myself and I do prioritize training over rest or meeting or like emails over sleep. And 
I think sometimes I burn my candle on the both ends a little harder than I want to. And I'm also surrounded by a world that does that all the time. So it makes it feel okay. Um, that part I, I'm trying to be better at because I do want longevity and I want to be healthy. And like you said, like <clears throat> I sacrifice my mental health sometimes. Like my first year filming with TGR, I had like broken up with my long-term boyfriend, was living in a basement with no windows and decided to go sober and was filming every single day. And at the end of it, I was like in a pretty nasty depression and I didn't even notice it because I was like you said, riding highs and then like dropping and riding high. But then it was like slowly going to a, a bad place. And I just feel like that's the one part that I struggle with. It's just like, there's a lot of asks on us as athletes and we're capable and we're yes people. So we make it happen. But I just, I would love to find a place where I'm not redlining all the time, just some of the time. Since your success, I'm trying to think of the right way to ask this. Cause I think you are, you've put in the groundwork. You've got like a good position in the industry now. Do you find yourself, do you find it's easier to say no to things or do you still feel that pressure to say yes to everything? I think it's a, I feel I've gotten better at saying no to things that I definitely know I don't want to do, but a lot of the ideas that come across are really cool and I want to be a part of it. I'm a yes woman as we've come to. So I think I just learned that lesson last year of like, if you want to make a really good project, you need to put the majority of your time to it. So I think this year is going to, I'm going to try to flex that muscle as much as possible. But I mean, it's a hard to say no to something like, you know, heli skiing or like any trip with people that you like, regardless of what you're making and you get to go hang out. Like that's my favorite part of this whole industry. So I tend to just burn that candle and then hopefully rest come May. I like that you say, I know, I have no idea. No one presents those opportunities to me. They're like, Hey, do you want to go to this shitty place in new England? And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I guess I'll go there. Like that should be fun. We'll probably hike for like seven hours and then we'll get like 300 foot of vert and it'll be, then it'll be a little schwacky. It'll be some like bushwhack and then you'll get like another three, yeah, it'll be great. It'll be really good for your physical health. And it'll probably break you mentally. It's going to be I great. Think, yeah. <laughs> it's going to be great. It's going to be great. Uh, I have a couple more questions. I don't want to keep you too much longer. I've had you for about an hour. Um, is there a slogan that you say before you drop? Like, does that question make sense first off? Yeah. Okay. To be honest, I feel like in my, a lot of my early interviews, and I think it's still on my Instagram, there's like a hold it wide open term. It's like a, you know, like a motorcycle reference of just like full throttle. So that's like something that I think is kind of a, more of a motto of like how I like to live life. But on top of a line, to be completely honest with you, I'm like kind of, I'm talking, to, I'm talking myself up like, all right, you got this, Kate got this buddy like you know and it's funny because I noticed I know other people do it but I noticed it in the Nexus film Michelle was doing it on top of a line and it was so validating and so lovely because it's like it feels foolish sometimes but I feel like if I almost like talk to myself as a coach would talk to me I'm able to like calm myself down I don't know it's goofy but usually words of affirmation <laughs> do you talk to yourself in the third person I, I would say I really don't use Kate that much, but a little bit, I would say a little bit and on lines or like you can, I sometimes talk out loud. Like I'll be like, Oh, there's like on Alaskan lines where it's really roll over steep and you can't see where you're at from the top. And then I roll over and it's like, Oh, there's that cliff over there. Like, you know, it's embarrassing, but I'm like talking to myself. No, I love that. <laughs> and I think it's human. Like, I think we all do it and you know, everyone's got GoPros now. So you like listen to your footage and you're like, what the fuck did I say? Like, I'm literally coaching myself. Like, you got it. No problem. Don't panic. Like, you're like, you're on the mountain bike and you're like, just point it, just point right through your, your bike will do it. You'll eat it. And then like, I think it's, I, I think it's like you said, like about Michelle saying, it's like, it's nice to hear that you say those things. Like, oh, yeah. it's, Talking all the time. I mean, yeah, it's kind of fun. I think it's great. I think, and I think they should just make an edit of just the shit you say to yourself. That would be great just like cuts quicks just like shit 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 oh good got it all right like oh right. yeah lots of that yeah you gotta have some shits in there um where's my question oh favorite music right now 
Hmm. I've been kind of on a driving a lot, so kind of sick of my music, and I've been really enjoying, like, God, I don't even know how to explain it. Like, female lyric, like, kind of like female rappers, but it's actually like a faster, pay- like, I don't know, a lot of, like, female artists right now. I can't even think of one to come off, but like I've been using my discovery weekly a ton lately. So I don't actually know the names of it, but I've been into like, yeah, these like honestly songs that could go into a ski film. Cause I'm kind of looking for songs for an upcoming ski film. So I'm just looking for that, like Odessa style, like catchy mystery, but with a woman's voice. And I've found some pretty cool stuff. So that's my next question. And it sounds like you don't know how to answer it maybe, but if you had to pick, a song right now to be in your edit, like season edit, what song would it be? Um, I would say there are a couple. Um, wet Leg, Wet Dream, I think would be pretty oh good. Oh, my but God. Thank you. It's like not super family friendly, but... Um, no one I likes also, wet leg. Where are these people in the universe? They have so many listeners and everybody I list, I tell to listen to wet leg. They're like, what is this? And I'm like, the best part is, is the way that I found out about wet leg, wet leg was because I was up in Alaska filming with MSP in February and Jeff Hoke, who runs the heli op is like a big, big into punk. And he had gone to one of their shows and was like, these guys, these ladies, like, have it going on. And he sent me a couple of playlists and I was like, Oh my God, they're so sick. I don't know what genre they are. I have no idea. I am a <laughs> punk kid through and through and I love wet leg. Like I don't, they're TikTok. Have you seen their TikTok? It's so like, I should get on there. It's just their faces saying the lyrics basically, but they're so like non-emotional and they just like lip it. And it's so they're, they're gangsters. They are. Yeah, I don't know. What if you had to do a park at it? Did you ever ski park? Did you just skip that whole phase of your life? Skip that phase of my life. Kind of freaks me out to this day. Um, a park at it. Some type of cool hip hop or something. I don't know. <laughs> something hip. Some cool hip hop. Young <laughs> thug, thug. That like, was like the park at it when I was young. That feels fitting. I'm sure. Yeah, I can't even picture myself as a park rat but i'm sure that would have been a hell of a time too. i think you and michelle parker should make a park at it in the spring this year at palisades you would crush me i'm literally spread eagles that's what i got baby i do sometimes i can like if there's a lot of powder pull off some other things but they're never pretty oh, i'm talking nothing but rails lip on blind two out all day and mouth guard yeah you can do it you do it in the spring you have all summer to recover it's fine See, I just like take, I, I, I pick and choose my wrists, you know, I feel like rails are kind of like, I miss that boat. Oh, I'm telling you a game of pig, like that would be such a fun, I guess it's too much risk, but like, <laughs> I just love seeing people who are really good at skiing suck at it. Yeah. I like that too. And like take a bunch of park skiers and do like a big line comp and they're just like, what the, f-? like, <laughs> it's different. Jay it's does such a, a different sport. Jay peak in Vermont does a, big line rail jam and you have to ski the face and then hit like three rails and it's like the best comp ever because it's just a shit show it's like a big mountain competition and then they hit rails that's great it's out of control uh let me see if i have any other questions for you hidden talent mm, hidden talent i don't I feel like I've shared all of my talents. I'm a stunt monkey. All right. No um, hidden talents. I feel, like, I feel like, and I'm sure boyfriends or even friends would disagree because I tend to bump cars sometimes, but I feel like I've got a really good depth perception ability at high speeds. Oh no. <laughs> but I try to park really fast and like nine times out of 10, it's golden. <laughs> I don't think that's a talent. I think it sounds like you crash a lot, but just claim to be a good driver. My insurance did go up this year, but oh no, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Uh, 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 are you tired of skiing pow yet? Mm-mm. 
there wasn't that much of it last season, so I'm pretty fired up. I think the East Coast is going to have more power than the West Coast this year. You got to climb tucks with the rest of them. I'm down. I uh, yeah, I'm curious to see what the snow does. It's definitely we have snow in the forecast and snow up high, so fingers crossed it just keeps coming. Love it, Kate, not Katie. Why is it <laughs> spelled like that? That's KT. It's her fault, not mine. KT. I got the last name right and the first name wrong. Yeah. I'm such garbage. Um, thank you. What do you have coming up next? What do you have? Out, I know you have a couple movies right now coming out or dropping or have dropped already. And then what are you looking forward to this season? There's so many questions here. And where can people follow you? So couple projects I've got circulating right now that I'm excited about are Nexus, all female film created by a mostly female team, Bar Fight, which is a five minute banger edit that kind of just compares skiing and bar fighting. And I like that one because it's fun and different. And then MSP anywhere from here, that's on tour right now and should be coming out online soon. I am going to be working on a full North Face project with Mary Rand, who's a snowboarder. Um, we pitched them this idea of going and posting up in Haynes for a month and they got excited about it. So they're giving us a creative freedom to tell that story. And I'm very excited about that. That'll be on my agenda for the majority of the season next year and focusing on that. And then what I miss. Um, where can people follow you? Instagram is the main follow point And my name is C-A-I-T-E underscore z is in zebra e l i f f is in frank it's a weird one come find me do you answer all your dms honestly one of the other reasons i'm fatigued and burnt out is i am always yes i n never let those go away weirdest dm you've ever gotten i don't have one but i want to share one that my friend had because it's better love it you know veronica paulson the backflip into corbett's someone asked her for her socks used socks. like to buy them or just to have them did she give like a weird did she give them to him i don't remember i think i think he may have offered money and she was like no this is getting weird and that's where it stopped but but i feel like most of mine are like weird ones are definitely spam i'm most just saying if anyone wants to buy my socks i will <laughs> sell you them seems like a good deal it could be <laughs> I will sell anything that I have. If someone wants like my U shirt, I'm not above that. I don't care. I don't want to work a nine to five. So I will sell <laughs> my socks. <laughs> we'll help pay rent. Yes. Uh, sponsors to thank. The North Face. Super thankful for those guys. They're the best. Uh, Blizzard Technica. Been with me since the beginning. Love their gear. Scott. Great Abby packs. Goggles, helmet, poles. 10 Barrel Brewing, fantastic beer. Can't go a day without it. Just kidding. Um, what else? Trading View, I work with the trading app. They've been awesome. They they pitched me a cyber cyberpunk, a dystopian cyberpunk um, photo shoot. And so I had to make that happen last year. And that was like super fun to be pushed in creative ways. And it turned out really cool. So yeah, I don't think I'm missing anybody. Great. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for doing this. Thanks for having me.